Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 12. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiast. I am very excited to introduce my special guest today, Tim Suttard. Tim, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I sure am. All right. I appreciate you being here. Tim Suttard grew up the son and grandson of a Ford dealer, and he began restoring cars at the young age of 14. In fact, he still has the first car he restored, a 1929 Ford that his grandfather had sold brand new. After graduating from Stetson University, he decided that America's car magazines focused too much on the wealthiest few, and so he started Grassroots Motorsports, a magazine geared towards regular people who enjoy fixing up and playing with common, readily available sports cars. This success led to the formation of a second publication, Classic Motorsports, which has become America's largest publication catering to the classic sports car enthusiast. And I'm proud to say I'm a subscriber and enjoy getting that magazine every month. These publications led to an events business that includes hosting the Classic Motorsports Midi, one of the oldest and largest vintage races in America, the Ultimate Track Car Challenge, and the Dollar 201X Challenge, series of low-cost events that has run for the last 10 years. Tim does a variety of contract publishing work that includes publication of the Amelia Island Concours Program, the World Challenge Fan Guide, and other Concours and race events. Tim maintains rallies, and races a collection of about 15 eclectic, mostly British sports cars, and has restored over 40 cars since that first Model A. So Tim, I've told our listeners a little about you, so would you take a moment and share a little more about your history, about your business, your interests, and your passion for automobiles? I've been a car freak my whole life. Uh, You know, when I was four years old, my dad, uh, in April, or probably late April, early May of 1964, said, we're going to go over and look at a Mustang. Being a Ford dealer, he meant the Ford Mustang, obviously. I didn't really know what a Mustang was at that point, but I don't remember much from when I was four years old, but I very clearly remember that day. And I don't even being, remember being that impressed with the car, but you know, if you remember three or four things from that early in your life, for one of them to be the introduction to the Mustang, I think it says a little bit about you. From then on, I was, I guess, pretty hooked. I grew up working in my dad's shop. Of course, I went off to college and didn't have a Ford dealer to build my cars in. I had a dirt floor garage, and at that point, I realized moving away from home might have not been that smart. But uh, I wanted to get in a warmer climate. I grew up in Massachusetts. Florida seemed like a way better place to be a car freak and restore cars and not have to deal with uh, freezing and snow and all that type of stuff. I, as you said, I started the the magazine. I Got into autocross and and, and joined the SCCA. There was no information out there. The the big car magazines would tell you how how fast your Ferrari would go 0-60 to and that type of stuff. But there was no information on how to fix up a 240Z. I bought an old 240Z at that time and wanted to figure out how to lower it and make it faster to autocross it. There just wasn't much out there. Uh, Sports car graphic came back briefly with a second incarnation uh i'd always liked that magazine i always liked hot rod but i thought hot you know hot rod i wasn't really interested in 57 chevys i wanted to to have a hot rod for the sports car world i guess so that's kind of what the idea was uh, i went to my dad i was just two years out of a high or college i went to my dad with a business plan and uh my new degree and about five thousand bucks that i had made selling a Shelby Mustang that I'd restored at that time. Of course, uh, selling a Shelby Mustang for that kind of money seems stupid today, but at the time it was it was good money. He looked at the plan, he looked at me, and he said, you really didn't need a, a 10-page business plan if you wanted to borrow three grand from me. And I said, well, I wanted to show you I was serious. And I still have that plan today, and it's still pretty close to what it is we're trying to do and what, what it is we do do. That's a fantastic story. I I love putting the business plan together and presenting it in a formal way. Now, was publishing something that you always had a passion for, or was it the other way around, where 
cars were the passion that drove the publication. Uh, definitely cars were passion. I, I was a lousy student in English. Uh, matter of fact, I went back to my high school English teacher once I started the magazine, and we had a good laugh because of all his students, the one that was going to make his living off the English language was not going to be me. <laughs> and uh, I had um, you know, studied advertising and marketing in college. I'd worked at a, a shopper newspaper for a little bit. I'd sold life insurance in college. So I definitely was building a resume of, of uh, sales and, and um, advertising experience. Uh, my wife, who's been with me the whole time, Margie, uh, was an English major and then turned into a business major. Uh, she was a good editor then and is, is a great editor now. So we kind of combined our experiences and made it work. Yeah, that's wonderful. When you first started the publication, what were some of the uh, the biggest obstacles that surprised you? Honestly, the hardest thing was, was circulation. Still probably the hardest thing. As a car freak, I just assumed that everybody was like me and that you would never let a magazine subscription lapse. Uh, when I get into the world, you know, the magazine world, I realized that if you could get 70, 80 percent renewal rates, you were doing phenomenal but that means you have to replace 20 or 30 percent of your customers every year just to stay even, not to grow. So, I mean, it takes constant, constant marketing and, and circulation management effort to grow a magazine. It's probably the hardest part about it. Well, I've known you for a while, and I've always thought you're one of the hardest working guys I've ever known. Going way back when we first met and we see each other at SEMA and so forth, it's hustle, hustle, hustle. And it seems like you're that kind of guy. I read your magazine, and I think, how on earth does he have time to go out in his garage and play with these cars? But it seems like he found a good balance. <laughs> there are some, including my wife, that would argue that. <laughs> of course. I have, uh, I, I, you know, over 30 years, and it will, we are hitting 30 years this summer. We started August 15th, uh, 84, so that'll be our 30th birthday. I have developed a pretty good staff, a really good staff. They carry some of the load. I probably spend more time in the garage and more time writing than any magazine owner. It's not really done out of ego. It's done out of, I love the cars, and you can't play with the cars unless you're willing to uh, write the story. So, you know, in my business, you can't just play with the cars. You have to tell your readers what you're doing. So I write. You know, I wasn't born to write. I, 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 I love running a business. I mean, back when I was a kid, I was going to college to learn how to run my own business. At that time, I didn't know what kind of business it was going to be. But So I would say the, the cars, I think I'm getting off track here a little bit, but the cars certainly come first. And I also had a strong desire to, to try to uh, help people and teach people and, and uh, help them enjoy the car hobby. And I really didn't think the, the big magazines at the time you know, were doing it. They talked down to people. One of the things that we've become known for is that we're very much of the people. You know, that's the way I like to be treated, and I think that's the way others like to be treated. Well, I think you've done that, and congratulations on 30 years. My goodness, that's a huge milestone. So kudos to you, and I think you've done exactly what you've targeted to do. Car people can smell a fraud a mile away if they realize, you know, this guy isn't, doesn't have dirt under his fingernails. He hasn't been out in the garage working on it. So you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. We like to start the show with a success quote, something that means something special to you. It's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So take the wheel, Tim. Well, uh, uh, I don't know who said it, but early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise is a pretty damn good way to lead your life. I wouldn't say that I've always done that. I, I, I go in cycles. Sometimes I'm up early. Sometimes I'm, I'm working late. But if, uh, you know, I... I Tell my kids that's a good way to live when they start sleeping until noon. <laughs> well, that is a good quote. In fact, the very first interview I had here in Cars yeah was with Rick Cole, and he said that was one of the things that has led to his success. He's the famous auctioneer. He gets up at 4, 4.30 in the morning, and he said, I'd much rather see a sunrise than a sunset. So it sounds like you two share a common practice in your life. That's great. How have you incorporated that? success quote into your life and your passion for cars is there a, a way that you're able to go to bed early and get up early and still do everything you have to do how do you manage all that well as, as i said i don't know if i've lived lived exactly like that what i tell people most is 
is you cannot give up. I mean, I think I think people, as soon as something gets hard, a marriage gets hard, or a, a business gets hard, or a job gets hard, they we're pretty quick to to give up or get frustrated. And you know, there are many many times it looked futile, and uh, I was told by loved ones to give it up and, and go get a real job, and I wouldn't, and I didn't. It shocks me, you know, I hire young people, I interview young people, and how many of them are not really, you know, a lot of them are scared to take a chance on their g- dream job, and, and then when they get it, they don't really want to work that hard at it. Unfortunately, I see some of that myself, so um, we've got to make sure we raise our children, right, to follow in those hardworking footsteps, for sure. My son's doing an internship this summer, and he's only been at it for a couple of weeks, and the gentleman gave him, already gave him a $100 bonus with his first paycheck, he only got it was going to get a three hundred dollar paycheck, and he said, "Why did you give me this?" He said, "You actually show up earlier than you're supposed to be here. You stay later. You clean up without being asked. We like having you around. So those are great, great things." Would you share with us a story that really instigated your passion for cars? Tell us that pivotal moment that made you an automotive enthusiast and where you really realized I'm a car guy. And I know you shared that Mustang, the trip to the the Ford dealership to see the Mustang, but was there anything else when you were young that you went, wow, I am a car guy. This is for me. I guess I never had that epiphany. It was just, it was always part of me. Uh, When I was 15, uh, my dad's best friend down the street ran a junkyard. He was also uh, selling uh, rebuildable wrecks. And he was doing it by auction. And I was down there in the junkyard all the time. And there was a 67 Mustang Fastback that they were selling, putting up for, a, you know, it was a sealed bid type auction. And uh, I had 100 bucks, but I bid, I was going to bid $101. And then I said, well, then if somebody bids 102 I mean, I had thought this out for days. I finally bid $102.02. I told my dad what I was doing, and he instantly said, absolutely not. You're not having a car at 15. You're not ready for this. There was a a fight. There was lots of fights in our teenage years. He straightened out after I turned about 22. (laughs) He straightened out. Yeah, Yeah, he got his act together. Oh, good. My mom kind of grabbed him and took him into the other room for a minute, and then they came back, and he said, okay, okay. Uh, I've changed my mind. You can you can bid on the car, but you're probably not going to win it. I did win the car for $102.02. Now, as I later found out, you know, this car wasn't worth thousands at the time, but it was worth hundreds. And a side deal had been, been, been made. And, you know, like I said, this place was run by my dad's best friend. So he went from absolutely can't have it to making it so that I did get it. And, and that was, the, you know, other than that Model A, that was the first, that was my first real car. And, I, you know, that started a, a succession. I've, as recently as, as Sunday, a, a buddy of mine comes to, my dad passed away last week, so he comes to the funeral in an old clapped out Miata with a hole in the top. And uh, he was bitching that he was going to have to drive it home in the rain. So I said, sell me the Miata for 1200 bucks, and I'll let you take one of my cars to get home with. I need some work done. He's a mechanic. I said, I need a couple things done on it anyway. During a funeral on Sunday, I bought a damn Miata. So, I mean, that's there's something wrong with me. I, I, I get that. Well, I think you just got the bug. But, uh, Mike, sincere condolences for your loss of your father. Obviously, he was uh, pivotal in uh, forming your passion for cars and in your life. Tim, I want to take a look at the journey you've taken and the roads that you've driven down and maybe crawl under the hood and get our hands a little dirty, which is something you do on a regular basis. But here, I'd like you to share a huge challenge or maybe even a major failure that's occurred along your business path here that really pushed you to the breaking point. And most importantly, how did you overcome that situation? Uh, I I overcome most bad situations with sheer willpower. Not a real bright guy. I'm uh, I'm more stubborn than anything else. Probably one of the the most pivotal pivotal things that, that I've went through that way was um, we built a rotary powered Spitfire about 15 years ago and it seemed like everything was nearly going to fit and it seemed like it was a pretty doable project and we got about halfway through it and realized that it was impossible 
everything just wasn't working. I had deadlines, and, and this is one of the, the biggest fights I ever had with my wife. And it came down to she said, you need to abandon that. And I said, no, I'm not going to. I've, I've put it out there. I've got it in print. We're going to finish the damn thing. And, and she nearly left me over that stupid car. Of course, now the car's long gone. And, but it was one of the most you know, pivotal uh, projects that we ever did. We kind of known for it. That was a that was a rough patch. Uh, you know, I couldn't really afford what I was trying to do. I didn't really have the knowledge to do what I was trying to do. I had a couple friends bail me out. That was a, a rough spot, and we did get through it. And 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 how did you get through that? What what were the the steps you took? Because our listeners love to hear about these kinds of stories because it inspires them to realize that they're going through something similar in their life. That there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I I interviewed Dominic Dobson yesterday who raced at Indy, and the first year he went there to qualify, he did it, and 10 minutes before the end of the qualifi- qualification session, he got bumped out. Went home, broke, dejected, and was ready to throw in the towel, but rallied and came back and was the fastest rookie the very next year. So what do you think you were able to pull up? And I know sheer willpower, you mentioned, is one of your attributes. You just pushed on through, and maybe it's as simple an answer as that. You know, it... it uh you know, a similar situation, more of a business situation, is in 89, I was at the Solo 2 Nationals. We were about five years into it at that point. And the printer, the printer, we were behind on our payments. We were struggling. There was a recession then. It had gotten hard. And uh, my, uh, the printer wasn't going to print the next issue. I ended up borrowing this. The one other time I borrowed five grand from my parents. And they said, this is it. This is the last time. This isn't working. You need to you need to quit. You need to give up. And I said, you know, I said to my parents and I said to my wife, if you have to abandon me, if you have to leave me, I get that, but I will not quit. I will I will, you know, down to the last penny, the last reader, I will not give up. And again, no sophistication there, just stubbornness and willpower and belief that the idea will pan out. And and I'm I'm saying this not to show you that I'm special, but I think most, you know, you 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 don't know the whole story behind a story, and I think uh, you know Steve Jobs and all these guys, Bill Gates, they probably have all had these moments. I mean, I don't think there's many success stories that are just poof instantaneous. There's a few, but. You know, most instant success stories are, are succession of hard hard work and and uh, in willpower. So that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah, I think it was Willie Nelson that said, "I was an overnight success. It only took 20 years." Yeah, exactly. That's great perseverance. That sounds like that was uh, something that worked for you, Tim. Let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum and share a story when you had that aha moment in your business, that time when you realize that your idea and your concepts really had merit and that you were going to make it. Could you tell us the step to turn that aha moment into a success? Every single day I would go to work and say, all right, let me see if I can keep us in business one more day. Wow. Uh, and finally about, well, part of it is is um, self-esteem is is not something I've, I've been full of, but you know, I'd, I'd look. I'd get up in the morning every every morning, and finally one one morning after about ten years, I said, "You know what? I don't think we're going to go out of business today." And that that kind of uh, you know change that that was kind of a fundamental shift in in you know how I dealt with things and how I organized things. And you got to remember, I started when I was twenty four years old. I mean, how many people are equipped to be the CEO of a company when they're twenty four years old? I'm still probably not very good at it at fifty four, but I've learned a lot over the last thirty years. Another big moment is we were we were trying to uh, we, we built our own sanctioning body back in the late eighties. Trying to we were trying to, again circulation was the bugaboo and we were trying to uh, create our own SCCA of sorts called the Council of Motorsports Clubs. There was a lot of tension in the SCCA at that time, and a lot of people came to me and said, "Hey, we should do something different." The SCCA is all about road racing, and we're about autocrossing and stuff like that, and. As it turned out, once we did it, they, then they came back and said, why did you turn on us? I'm like, that's what you guys said you wanted. So, But that's, that's a long story. But anyway, we sold that in, in uh, the spring of 92. And I'll remember clearly the July 92 issue 
we created that will race for food idea and had it on the cover of course then it was widely copied which I should have trademarked it but <laughs> we had um, three guys I think I was one of them on the cover with a spitfire with their one pulling the pockets you know out of their pants you know that the symbol for being broke and uh and a sign will race for food and that was a July 92 issue and our fortunes went straight uphill almost from 92 to the present. I mean, we we were really stagnant through the late 80s and our first couple of years in, in 1991. And then in 92, we, in 92, we went to, uh, we, we were only doing about a quarter million dollars total size of the company, pretty small company. But six years later, we hit our first million. So it went, it went up pretty good from there. Wonderful. Well, again, perseverance, just hanging in there and fight, fight, fight. Let's have a little fun here and can you tell me about your first car? More importantly, what kind of fun did you have with that car? Maybe trips, modifications? I assume there's maybe some restoration involved in there. Adventures and memories you had with that first car? Well, some of them I can't say in a public forum. But, <laughs> you know, we all have some of that in high school. But uh, it was that 67 Mustang Fastback. Uh, although I only had that car when I was 15, so I didn't have a license at that time. I bought it for 100 I fixed it up, I sold it for 800 and then my real first car that I started driving when I was 17, 16, 17, was another 67 a Mustang, this time a, an Alcapulco Blue Coupe. We put a 68 C-stripe on it and had baby moons and chrome reverse wheels, which was, uh, it actually was getting a little old-fashioned by the 77 when I built that car. That's the first car, you know, I had the coolest car in high school, you know, wasn't much competition in the late 70s, but... Uh, you know, today kids are driving new Z28s to school, which is crazy. But uh, so I took a trip to Washington, D.C. with my uncle in that car. We had a good time. You know, I was always the designated driver because I had the car. So we had, a, we had a lot of fun with that car. Sounds like you did. Have there been any cars or maybe a car that you've sold in your past that you have some seller's remorse about? You really wish you had it back? Well, I think, I think we all do. Um, probably the... The two that I think about, one in particular, is I had a uh, my fourth car. I went from that 67 Coupe to a 65 Fastback in 78. I sold that. A Mustang, right around the late 70s when the world woke up and realized the Mustang was going to be a collectible car. So it was right in that period where half the world thought they were junk used cars and half thought they were starting to be worth something. It's when some of the Mustang companies started. Uh, National Parts Depot started about that time, as did uh, um, Mustangs Unlimited in Connecticut, I think, started right around there. But uh, in when I was 19, I bought a 66 Hertz model Shelby uh, for 2700 bucks. Oh, my goodness. I turned around in 79, I bought it, fixed it all up, and sold it in 82. Guy gave me about six grand plus a junk ranchero for it. Uh, and I always lamented selling that car and I, I bitched at my wife that, that that our company owes me that car and finally a couple of years ago the prices dipped on Shelby's and and I bought a, I was looking for another 66 and a buddy of mine uh, said I got a 67 that I wanted that he wanted to sell and I didn't really want a 67 but just out of courtesy I wanted to go have lunch with the guy who's a friend and I looked at it I said well, you know why don't I want a 67 there this one was actually a factory air car four speed factory air car one of something like 11 made and they've got power steering, they've got power brakes, and they certainly have cooler styling and, and a little more comfortable than the, the rough and race-ready uh, 65s. So I ended up buying a 67 Shelby to make up for the, the 66. Of course, I still would kind of like a 66, but uh, I always want another car, so that's... Of course, it's a sickness. Well, congratulations on getting that car back. Would you share with our listeners, Tim, a project that really has you excited and, and fired up right now? This one's a weird one, but about a year ago, I put in Classic Motorsports that uh, the premise that if you were if you were kind of clever and, and looked around, you could find one of these uh, specials, kits, specials, whatever you want to call them. But in the late 50s, especially over in England and some in this country, there were different specials, uh, kind of like, well, in, in this country, there was ladaris and, and victresses i mean you could call them kit cars but some of them had their own frames and i guess that's how i designate if something's got its own frame it's a special and if it's something you put on another you know if you put it on a 49 chevy frame it's it's a kit yeah i'm not sure that's a true designation but that's that's the way i've got it in my mind 
So I put this out there and I said, you know, if you're smart for like rubber bumper MGB money, you could find something that's eligible for any event in the world. Guy sends me an email from up in northern Wisconsin. He says, I got just what you need. And I said, well, first off, it's not what I need. I, I'm the magazine guy. I'm just trying to give you guys ideas. I don't need another damn project. And he said, well, put your money where your mouth is, Sutter. I've got a 1958 Tornado Typhoon, which was an English special. Uh, they used Ford uh, side valve, English Ford mechanicals. So he sold it to me for, you know, I said, all right, fine, I'll do it. So he sold it to me for 4000 which is pretty, you know, pretty lean money in our world. And I, we've got it about halfway together. I had lunch with Bill Warner about a month ago, who runs Amelia Island Concord, and told him about the car and showed him some pictures. And he said, uh, I'd like to have that at Amelia next year. Oh, Wow. So my uh, my story, you know, my story premise is is coming true. Uh, of course, once he says I need it at Amelia, now I've got ten months to completely restore something. That's and it's you know you don't just call Moss and order order parts for this thing. It's kind of an oddball. They made three hundred of them. The pressure is on. It's kind of a lousy car in that it's it's got a uh, a Ford side valve. It's about as sophisticated as a Model A Ford. It's got a torque tube drive and it's got a, a side valve flathead engine. Cable brakes, no no hydraulic brake, not even disc, not not even you know the drums are are cable actuated. Oh my goodness! Uh, but I've found a book on the cars and I've studied the cars and, and honestly, in the late fifties when there wasn't that much competition, the cars were very competitive in small bore racing and uh, pretty popular. And uh, so to you know to learn about a a weird company and about how the company went and how it how it rose and then how it fell and and to to go through this car and to learn about it and, and to try to understand it, you know, there's not a, a ton of information on the internet about it or in publications. So it's it's been a fun learning experience, and I think I've got it talked into the the or at least I've talked to the folks at the uh, Colorado Grand. It'll probably be the slowest car they've ever had on that event, but there was some interest there too. So if you find something weird and you're willing to put up with the weirdness of it. You know, you show it up at a show or an event with something like that, and the row of MGs and Triumphs, those guys, they like to see something different. Oh, absolutely. I've been to a local Cars and Coffee here up in Seattle, and a gentleman showed up with an old Panhard. Yeah, and I know. everybody, you know, next to it was a Ferrari Italia and a Lamborghini, but everyone was standing in front of that car, scratching their heads, saying, what is this thing? And when he opened the hood, the eyebrows went up even more. So that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. What's your favorite way to spend time with your cars? I kind of think I know the answer to this, but maybe you'll surprise me. Is it hanging out in the garage, wrenching on them, restoring them, detailing them, driving them? I've often told people that if you said to me, you can never work in the garage again or you can never race again, I would I would hang up my helmet. I mean, I like racing and I do race some. You know, racing's a little bit like scuba diving, though. It's, you know, snorkeling's real simple. And then once you have to get into all the, you know, autocrossing's real simple, but once you have to get all the equipment and the money that it takes to do real racing, it's a little like scuba diving. And it's maybe you know it's it's worth the hassle once you're there, but the prep and getting ready for it's kind of a pain. So I love I love uh, just quiet time in the garage. You know, there's different kinds of time. Welding and and uh, panel work is you know that's that's when I put on ACDC and sparks are flying and it, it's relaxing, but in a very you know it's a very physical hard thing to do. And then Carefully cleaning cl- chrome and assembling, you know, taillight assemblies and stuff is relaxing. And you put on some, uh, you know, maybe Nora Jones or some mellower music, and uh, you know, it's a different kind of experience. Uh, I like studying of the cars. Uh, as far as driving them goes, we really like these long distance rallies. We put on one here in Florida called the Orange Blossom Tour that starts and ends at the Amelia Island Concourse. Uh, we've gone on the Going to the Sun Rally up in Montana is a phenomenal way to enjoy your car as far as you know and i've i've been lucky uh hot rod did a i wish it my, was my idea but hot rod a couple of years ago did the hundred bucket list things you need to do and i went through the list and honestly have done like i don't know 60 60 or 70 of them that's that's pretty you know 30 years in this industry you get invited to a lot of cool stuff and you and you go to a lot of it on your own but a classic car rally uh they may look expensive outwardly you know they cost five or six grand to go on uh, best five or six grand you can spend with your car. Uh, and it's not, 
yes, it's the safety net of having, you know, somebody fix your car if it breaks, but more importantly, the people that you meet and uh, the cars, the people, the camaraderie. Uh, we've made some really cool lifelong friends on these classic car rallies. You know, New England 1000 and those events, uh, Texas 1000, those are put on by Rich and Gene Taylor. Uh, phenomenal events. I would highly recommend a car guy do that at least once. Uh, we've been on about 10 of them now, and that's that's honestly the way we enjoy our sports cars the most. Sounds fun. Sounds real fun. Tim, this is one of my favorite parts of our talk. I call it the last lap, and this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give the listeners very quick blips of the throttle answers. So are you ready? This is like a job interview. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. All right. Okay. Do I get the job then? Well, we'll see. All right. <laughs> okay, here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? Buy low, sell high. Or uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Buy. You know what? Really, and it's it's a common thing. Buy buy the best you can afford. You you never save money doing it yourself. I always do it that way because I love it, and I got to have something to write about. But buy the best. You know, people are. Uh, I know I'm supposed to go quick here, but I mean, people are go- people in Connecticut will buy a rusty car in Connecticut rather than drive to Alabama to get a rust-free car. It's so much easier. I mean, it's not easier, but it's so much cheaper in the long run to go to California, Alabama, Arizona, and get a decent car and not buy a rusty piece of crap up in Connecticut. Sure. Sorry, Connecticut listeners. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, man. Can you share one of your personal habits that you believe contributes to your success? I guess the two things are you just try to treat people the way you want to be treated and follow through. You know, it's funny how much business, I, I mean, even you the other day, you, you asked me to for a couple things and I shot it right back to you and you came back at me and said, wow, I'm so shocked you, you did that right away. It's like, well, of course I did. You asked me to. <laughs> and then, and then you think, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, just showing up is so rare these days. Just doing what you say you're going to do. And, and as you said, your son, it's not hard to compete in today's world if you just come in five minutes early and stay five minutes late. Uh, most people don't. But most people just go through the motions. Well, and that's an answer I've heard from many, many people. So thanks for sharing that. Do you have a resource, Tim, that you'd like to share with our listeners that you really enjoy, perhaps a website or a supplier well, I should probably pimp my own websites. Well, of course, you can do that. Our message board, uh, grassrootsmotorsports.com, is a phenomenal community. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a-holes on, on message boards around the world, and, and you know the moderator kind of sets the tone, but there's a lot of snippiness, and, and ours really doesn't have it. And there's a lot of genuine good people, and they're very quick, very smart with their advice. Um, I would recommend they people check out our message board it, it is and i guess everybody says this but ours is truly amazing you to give you a quick example this this tornado that i'm restoring i i put something up and within half an hour i needed it to get it somewhere and within half an hour a retired reader says i'll transport it for you for for 100 bucks plus some gas money or something i mean there's just we had a guy trying to uh get his car cross country and he was down on his luck and our readers just helped him and just time after time, our message board is just filled with great people. How can our listeners access that message board? Uh, grassrootsmotorsports.com. It's right there. There's a lot of bravery behind keyboards on some of these forms and mess- yeah, message and boards. Ours is thankfully absent. Uh, part of it is is my wife and my editor, my wife Margie and my editor David, are, and my son Tom actually does a lot of the moderating too, and, and we're, we don't deal with it. We just, you're gone. Well, good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Tim, would you share a book that you've really enjoyed recently with our listeners? Yeah, uh, Small Wonder. Small Wonder, who's that by? I don't know. It's, it's, it's out of print, I think, but it's the story of the Volkswagen Beetle. Oh, yes, okay. It's an amazing story. It's a story about a car, but it's also a story about a country. It's a story about uh, post-war Germany and, and, and how they got back on their feet. It's one of the best car books I've ever read. Uh, and I also just read John Morton's uh, book on, uh, that's actually it, uh, his book on the Cobra, the early years of Cobra. Okay. Working for Shelby American. All right. John Morton, uh, Cobra, the early years, I think it's called. Okay. Well, we'll make sure that we get all these links up on com, and the listeners can just log into com slash Tim Suttered, 
go to your show notes page and we'll we'll make sure all these links get posted up there. So Tim, now we're at the checkered flag. Being a racer, okay. I think you like the checkered flag, especially if you're in the front of the, the racetrack there. This last question can sometimes be a challenge, and I like to call it a real doozy. If you could have only one collector car in your garage... 289 Cobra. <laughs> okay, I didn't even get to finish, but you have that, have it all figured out. Okay, go ahead. Blue, uh, what was it? I think it was Acapulco Blue, or it might have been Guardsman, Guards Blue, with the uh, dark red interior, uh, gray wires, and I'd like it to be a, a rack and pinion car. Okay, <laughs> that was too easy. Well, Tim, you've taken us on a great ride today, and I really enjoyed your stories. I want to thank you for sharing your journey with our listeners. If you could give them one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset, I would appreciate it. And then let them know what is the best way for them to find out about your business. Well, yeah, I would love for them to, if if, if every one of them read our magazines, I might be able to afford that Cobra, although they keep getting more expensive. We'll work on that. Our websites are grassrootsmotorsports.com and classicmotorsports.net. Uh, one one magazine's geared towards the newer cars, you know, let's say 5 to 25 years old, and the other one's geared for older cars, you know, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Parting advice, enjoy what you do, enjoy playing with your cars, and, and be nice to people. That's perfect. Listeners, you can find all the links we've talked about here at carsyad.com slash Tim Suttered. S-U-D-D-A-R-D, and just type in Tim in the search box, and you'll find the show notes page. Tim, thanks for being so generous with your time and your expertise and sharing your experiences with our listeners. Until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!